One summer day, a man named Ellen Southern was returning home from work as usual. He was looking forward to dinner and an evening of relaxation with his wife and son. Unfortunately, what he found when he got home was the opposite what he expected. Ellen found his wife Judy injured in the garden near their house when he arrived home. In this story, the detectives had to avoid rush conclusions so that the real culprit could be punished for his crime. It should have been a normal summer day for Ellen's family. 40-year-old Judy Southern came home from work at around 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon. Her husband Ellen was still on his way home from work and their 5-year-old son Jacob was at home with their relatives. There seemed to be nothing wrong in the family's life. But when Ellen returned home from work, he was faced with a terrible event. He pulled up to his house and found his wife Judy lying injured on the lawn. Ellen rushed to his injured wife to find out what happened. Although Judy remained conscious for a few minutes, she managed to explain to Ellen what had happened. According to Judy, there was a stranger who had broken into their home and the stranger had shot Judy twice with a gun, the bullet hitting her in the abdomen. Trying to save herself, Judy ran outside and tried to call her husband in his office on his cell phone. Ellen was already on his way home by then. The last thing she could tell him was that the name of the man who had shot her was Barry. After saying this, Judy lost her conscience. Ellen decided not to wait after calling 911 because he was afraid of losing time to save his wife. He took the unconscious Judy in his arms, placed her in the back seat of his car and drove quickly to the nearest hospital. Despite Ellen's best efforts to act quickly in this situation, doctors couldn't save Judy in time because she had lost too much blood. Judy died in hospital during the surgery. That same evening, detectives received information from the 911 operator and launched an investigation into the incident. They learned that deceased Judy worked as a mailman and had a normal family life. At first glance, it seemed that Judy wouldn't have had any enemies who could have committed such a crime against her. The detectives thought it looked like an attempted burglary at the Southern family's home, so they had to check the house for evidence. When they arrived at the Southern home, the detectives spoke to Ellen and learned that nothing had been stolen from their home or Judy's belongings but that the unknown intruder had left behind a suspicious amount of evidence. The detectives discovered that the offender had used many of Southern family's belongings while alone in their home. While in their home, the offender ate their food, drank their tea, stole their son's Jacob's console, took a shower, and repeatedly smoked cigarettes. The cigarette butts were scattered through the Southern family home. But neither Ellen nor Judy smoked his brand of cigarettes. As detectives continued to investigate the southern home, they discovered that there were no signs of forced entry and that all windows and doors were intact. After examining the shell casing found in the house, experts determined that the perpetrator used a 9mm handgun. At this point in the investigation, detectives were tasked with finding out who the perpetrator was and how he got in the Southern family home. According to Ellen, before his wife Judy died, she told him the name of the person who shot her was Barry. The detectives were hoping to get information from Ellen about who Barry was, but Ellen knew nothing about a person with that name. Trying to understand how Judy knew the name of the criminal, the detectives continued to investigate in the crime scene and found an important piece of evidence. Not far from where Ellen found his injured wife, the detectives found a crumbled piece of paper. When they examined the piece of paper, they found what appeared to be a farewell note written before her death. The letter was addressed to a woman named Melanie Binney. The man who wrote the letter confessed that he was sorry for committing this crime and said he was going to end his life. 
At the end of the letter, he wrote, I love you. I'm sorry it ended this way. I leave everything I have to my loving, caring wife. At the end of the paper, the man who wrote this letter signed his first and last name. Because of the incomprehensible handwriting, the detectives couldn't make out exactly what was written. The first name looked like Jonathan, and the last name was written in a very illegible way. However, the spelling Barry was dissimilar. Based on this information, detectives concluded that Judy had time to read the letter before she died, and therefore believed that Barry was the name of the criminal who shot her. Detectives checked the name Jonathan Barry against the police database. However, no such person was identified, considering that the letter was addressed to a woman named Melon Beanie and that the writer of the letter referred to her as his wife. Detectives concluded that the last name of the perpetrator was Beanie, not Betty. Furthermore, the letter they found had the address of Melanie Beanie at the beginning of the letter and detectives decided to check the house at that address. When they arrived at the registered address of the Beanie family, the detectives found neither Jonathan nor his wife Melanie there. While a group of police officers went to look for Jonathan in the city, the detectives decided to return to the police station and check the police database for information about Jonathan Beanie. What they learned came as a shock. Jonathan Beanie, 26 years old, was under investigation for allegedly raping his own daughter. Even more horrifying was the fact that his daughter was only 3 months old. At the time, Jonathan was free on bail, but he had a rape trial ahead of him. Although Jonathan was already considered a criminal, this is no way explained his connection to Judy, who had lost her life. According to Judy's family and friends, no one knew a man by that name. Jonathan and Judy were completely strangers. They had no common bond, and so the motive for the murder was unclear. Detectives began to think that Jonathan Beanie's letter might have arrived at the Southern family home by mistake, or that the whole thing might have been premediated. They speculated that the real culprit was a different person, but that he had left specially prepared evidence to make the police think that Jonathan Beanie had done it. In any case, detectives needed to find Jonathan so that they could take his DNA and fingerprints and compare them with samples of evidence from the crime scene. Police search teams continued to look for Jonathan all over the city for the rest of the night, but they were unsuccessful. The next morning, detectives again went to Beanie family home and were surprised to find Jonathan right there. It turned out that Jonathan was hiding in the basement of their house with six nicotine patches taped to his chest. The detectives asked him why he had so many patches and got a very strange answer. According to Jonathan, he wanted to end his life and true he could overdose with so many patches. Despite the absurdity of the situation, detectives arrested him and took him to the police station for questioning. During the arrest, Jonathan asked the detectives if the woman he attacked was dead. Although this question seemed like an admission of guilt, it wasn't so simple. Upon arrival at the police station, detectives began questioning Jonathan. However, Jonathan denied he had confessed to the crime and stated that he wouldn't say anything in the absence of his personal lawyer. While Jonathan Beanie was in custody at the police station, medical experts took a DNA sample. As a result, Jonathan's DNA match, DNA found on cigarette butts at the Southern family home. Over the next two days, detectives were able to locate the weapon used to kill Judy. They examined the road leading from Jonathan Beanie's house to the Southern family home and found 9mm pistol discharged on the ground along a section of the road. Experts carried out ballistics on the gun and determined that Judy had been shot with it. Forensics also identified Jonathan's fingerprints on the gun. The detectives said enough undisputed evidence to prove that Jonathan was Judy's killer. However, according to the rules of the case, the detectives needed to document the motive for the crime. This was a problem because they still hadn't found a reason for Jonathan to commit such a crime with a completely unrelated person. 
the detectives decided to check whether the letter found at the crime scene was really written by Jonathan. A special expert conducted a comparative analysis of this letter and the statement written by Jonathan's own hand in connection with the crime against his daughter. The expert was able to find some important features of the Jonathan Beanie's handwriting and thus was able to prove that the letter found at the crime scene were indeed written by Jonathan. Jonathan refused to communicate with the police while in custody. The detectives decided to investigate Judy's husband, Alan, just in case. According to criminal investigation practice, detectives were required to check on person present at the scene before the police arrived. During the investigation, the detectives discovered that Alan had secretly placed a recording device on his home phone so that he could listen to all phone conversations. Wanting to find out the reason for Alan's strange behavior, the detectives decided to talk Trudy Smith, the twin sister of the deceased Judy. Trudy revealed that Judy and Ellen's family life wasn't as good as it seemed from the outside. It turned out that Ellen had cheated on his wife twice and Ellen suspected she was having a secret affair with another man. This fact explained why Ellen had been eavesdropping on conversations on her home phone. Recently, Judy and Ellen had even discussed ending their marriage but they didn't file for divorce because they didn't want to cause any psychological trauma to their five-year-old son. In the last few weeks before Judy's death, the southern couple began sleeping in the separate rooms. Judy told her twin sister Trudy that two days before her death, she told her that she could no longer tolerate the marriage and wanted to divorce Ellen as soon as possible, but was afraid of Ellen's reaction. If anything bad happens to me, it will be Alan's fault. Judy told her sister frighteningly. Given all the information they had about Judy and Alan's strained relationship, the detectives began to see Alan as an accomplice in Judy's murder. In addition, Alan could have had several motives for committing this crime. First, he could have been jealous of Judy, suspecting her secret romantic relationship. Second, by committing such a crime, he could have gotten his wife insurance payment of more than $100,000 and avoided losing custody of his son in the event of their divorce. Detectives theorized that Ellen may have somehow encouraged Jonathan Beeney to commit that crime or that they may have committed the crime together. To find out the truth, the detectives administered a polygraph test to Ellen, but to their surprise, Ellen passed the test. Despite all the difficulties in their relationship, Ellen denied any involvement in his wife's murder. By this point in the investigation, the detectives had reached a dead end. They had two people suspected of the murder. Ellen theoretically had a motive for the crime, but there was no evidence against him. Jonathan had plenty of evidence against him, but no motive for the crime. As investigations continued, the local police arrested Ellen, but a month after the incident, there was an unexpected twist in the story. Jonathan, who has in prison on remand, asked to speak to the detectives without a lawyer and confess everything. Detective Spike McGraw, who interviewed Jonathan, said it was one of the strangest interrogation he had ever seen in his career. Jonathan admitted that all the evidence against him was true and that he had killed Judy. The reason he did was that he had previously been prosecuted for the alleged rape of his daughter and Jonathan was terrified of going to the prison for it. He said that he had read on the internet that people in prison for this type of offense were treated very harshly. So he decided to commit a murder so that he could be put in another part of the prison with murder status. Jonathan told detectives that he had never met the southern family and didn't know who Judy was. He had only entered a house he had chosen at random and the window was half closed. When he was alone in the southern family home, he spent time there waiting for someone to arrive. Jonathan didn't care who entered the house. He planned to shoot the first person who entered the house. He purposely left all the evidence at the crime scene because 
that was his idea of the going to the jail as a murderer. When the detectives asked Jonathan if he knew Alan, he said he didn't know him at all. After Jonathan's confession, the police released Alan, Judy's husband, from the prison custody. In 2002, Jonathan's trial took place and Jonathan fully admitted his guilt. The court sentenced him to the death penalty which is allowed under South Carolina state law. While awaiting the death penalty, Jonathan appealed several times and was successful. For those who don't know, an appeal is a legal remedy available to party or both parties to a case when the final decision made by both the court of first instance and the court of appeal to be unfair or erroneous. Jonathan signed a written agreement that if he verdict was overturned and the sentence was commuted to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, he wouldn't appeal again. The local court accepted this offer. In addition, Jonathan officially changed his gender and recognized himself as a transgender person. He also officially changed his name, changed his name to Taylor Alex Cross. For more videos like this and to support me, don't forget to subscribe to my channel, like and comment on the videos. See you in the next video.